Uh, I'll be talking about uh, fundamentals of social design based on citizen participation. It's a mouthful, but uh, just bear with me. As Connor uh, introduced, uh, I'm here on behalf of Bron Van Dun. Uh, we are a design studio um, dedicated to socially engaged projects. And what do I mean by that? Rather than trying to explain, I'll show you some of our work uh, over the course of the presentation. But there is one thing missing here that's very important to understand um, who we are as designers, is that it's based and focused on the city of Eindhoven in the Netherlands. We do socially engaged projects in Eindhoven. So it's a really big adventure for us to be, let's say, outside of the city outside of the Netherlands, in Germany, in Munich, to share not just what we do, but also um, the principles of how we operate and sort of discuss and share, can we work together? Can we also uh, learn from each other? So at our studio, the question we always ask ourselves is because we are a group of designers, um, how can we work together with people in Eindhoven? And please bear that in mind while I go through my presentation, because that is sort of the perspective we have and the attitude we have in all of the work we do. But since here, I think a very important thing is to be aware that from your perspective, uh, can there be points of reference, learn from things that we do well, learn from things that we do not do well, and be able to fill in the, the gaps with things that are, let's say, more important for you and I truly hope that um, tonight's not just presentation, but after it was a fishbowl and our, it was all our conversations, um, we can uh, help each other out. So going back to um, the, the title, I say social design and I say citizen participation. Uh, we're not a group of researchers, so I won't try to get too much into how to define things. But I think for myself, I would like to have a bit of a better understanding of who is here. Uh, I've heard that most of you are based here in Winnick. Is that true? Are there people here from other places rather than Winnick? Uh, a small amount. Um, are there people who work in the creative industry? Artists, designers? Wonderful. Students? Yes. Uh, and from the business sector, entrepreneurs. Great, thank you. And just a group of uh, happy people, very diverse. <laughs> That's what I like to hear. So when I say social design, um, not trying to make a, uh, explain a definition about it, I just want to have some keywords and see at least if you can agree about that. Um, I'm assuming that you all know what design is, of course product design, uh, graphic design, web design. Uh, when we talk about social design, a big keyword is responsibility. It was popularized by uh, Victor Papanik uh, in the 1970s and 80s about that designers have a responsibility of something. And that was his starting point, and he advocated that. And based on that, there has been a lot of changes in the practice of design. So responsibility is being responsible of something, environment, ecology, uh, society, I don't know. Um, but that is one keyword. Uh, social design, we think of strategic. Uh, a lot of the practices of social design actually come from service design. So, uh, and service design inherently is extremely strategic. Uh, it works in business, it works in the public sector to address various challenges and issues, and uh, uh, having strategic processes and the mindset is very important, which is also in uh, social design. And the one last thing that we like to add in our studio is urgency, whatever is urgent. And of course, that's different for everyone and also everywhere. <laughs> Something very simple as uh, there's a problem in the sewage. That could be an urgency. Poverty could be an urgency. But something maybe a bit more, maybe the sidewalks, there's something wrong with it. 
and might be urgent for some local people who have difficulty in, tran in, in walking or transportation, so whatever. Um, so these are sort of the things that come up, at least from in our studio, comes to mind when we think of uh, social design. Yeah? And citizen participation is an even bigger thing. Um, I mean, it comes from one of the fundamental uh, ideas of democracy, but when we talk about citizen participation, at least in our studio, it starts with, of course, people, diverse people. Um, and it's about the notion of that diverse people are not just influenced by institution, but independent people can also be an influencer of uh, various uh, uh, important things. Thank you. And lastly, we would think of process, uh, not just the result of something or the conclusion of something. We want to think of the whole process of the above mentioned people being influenced in order to, uh, no, sorry, people involved in order to also influence things such as policy. Um, so primarily, I'm going to talk about three things as fundamentals in these in social design citizen participation, motivations, ownership, and resources. But again, um, this is a presentation in making. So actually, there are many more things that came to mind preparing this presentation about what are like fundamental things when we think of social design in society. And the reason I chose these three, I wouldn't say it's because they're the most important, because to be honest, I'm not really sure. I just more want to talk about it uh, here tonight. And to be even more specific, uh, those the three things I'm talking, I will talk about inherent motivations, perceived ownership, and uh, accessible resources. And rather than explaining it here, I'll just go through my presentation and sort of so, show by example uh, from my own work, again, based in Eindhoven. So I'll start with uh, inherent motivations. Um, a question that we sort of realized, oh, by the way, we've been working in Eindhoven for about three years. We're a pretty young studio. We graduated from Design Academy Eindhoven between the year 2013 and 2014, so uh, we're very fresh in that sense. And along the way, one thing we learned was that working together with people from the perspective of participation is, yeah, just because I think it's a great idea as a designer doesn't mean other people will as well, even if I really believe in it. So I'll show you what I mean. One of the projects that we do in Eindhoven is called New Out, literally New Old. It started with our working together with an uh, elderly care organization called um, Vitalis uh, Windsor Group. And they're specialized in the welfare and care of older citizens in Eindhoven. They have many branches in the city. And they have a branch uh, called um, Birkenloof just across the street from our small studio. And since 2014, we've been just doing a bunch of stuff with them, or trying to do a bunch of stuff with them. And the picture you see on the left is a picture from 2014 during Dutch Design Week when we did a whole social design event within the elderly home for nine days in a row. Exhibitions, workshops, and most importantly, discussions. This is an image of a discussion. And while we brought in, let's say, from our perspective, a lot of innovation, social design, um, it was an opportunity for us to also listen to the, the elderly and learn from them in terms of what they find interesting. And one of the things that triggered us after Dutch Design Week was a really hidden gem for the older folks uh, in Eindhoven was their personal heritage. It's not about how skilled they are. It's not just about you know, the old school recipes or whatnot. It's just their personal experience that accumulated over their life, which is sort of like an untold story if they just pass away. Because, yeah, um, for them it's their life, but they don't have a reach to, uh, to share that story. So the picture on the right is from a project last year. Uh, during our co-design process with them, identifying you know, their 
uh, experiences, with their passions, and so forth. So based on that, New Out is a project about where we start from the personal heritage of older person, and based on that, we invite a younger talent. So we have an old person and a young person working together to make something. And being a designer, I like to call it design, but honestly, it's not just design. Artwork, uh, radio shows, uh, performances, just whatever is uh, dear to them. And this is a picture from last year, Dutch Design Week 2016, in the city hall when uh, we, uh, yeah, did a presentation as part of the city exhibition with New Out, but also this is a picture of during Dutch Design Week that we had a small excursion, got the whole crew, the, the old talents in a big bus, and uh, basically did a tour uh, of Dutch Design Week because, again, since they're in the care home, it's not very often they uh, get to go out to the city center anymore. So it's a project about personal heritage, and it's about this intergenerational, and as designers, what we do in it is do co-design, co-creation. We make a whole process for this to work. So it's a six-month process from beginning to end, where we have workshops to get to know others, and then we do workshops that are developing designs, and then we create uh, podiums and uh, events to share uh, what they have done. So in this case, uh, we learned working together with Vitalis that it's the personal heritage that is a strong motivator. And uh, from a lot of the trajectories that came out of this project, the ones related to um, uh, old experiences of their memories of the city, of the street they lived in, about stories about a passed away family member, um, old hobbies that they could not do because of age and health, for instance, were very strong motivators to, for them to participate and, yeah, um, be part of the project. Another example um, from a different note is uh, what we call breadcrumb workshops, but basically it's technology workshops. So we also do a lot of technology workshops. And uh, we like to work together with uh, communities and people who, yeah, you could say underprivileged, but basically have less experience or less exposed to working with technology, exploring technology. Uh, this is a workshop that we did, oh, uh, yeah, this is a workshop that we did um, to introduce the basics of wearable technology to um, uh, a group of older people who are very skilled in textile work. They've been working with traditional textile techniques all their lives. They can make dresses. Uh, that's something that we can't do as designers. But at least we want to see what happens if we sort of introduce the very basic fundamentals, what leads to wearable technology. It's just basically how can you make uh, electric circuit that something you can wear? How can you work with sensors? Ba very basic things. But just seeing, you know, uh, if we introduce a new way of working on top of their traditional way of working, what will happen. And we had a lot of fun. They made accessories and brooches, very precise that, again, we couldn't produce just using the, the basic materials that we offered. This is a photo that we worked in a school. Um, we called it the calculator room. Uh, basically, we take an old school calculator, we hack it open, and we make the whole room into an interactive calculator. Loads of fun. Uh, we had a lot of good reception. And in the workshops, what we try to do is uh, well, big words again, technological literacy, emerging technologies, basically keep creating opportunities to explore technology, not just use it. And that, in order to that also help, especially for younger people to broaden their horizons, maybe they can consider uh, a career or learning technology, but also to help people be more equipped in this day and age. But I'm mentioning this in this segment because I thought this was a really good idea. Like, I really believe in it. And that's why we're still developing projects and programs related to working with technology. But it turned out, uh, especially in the neighborhoods we work with, it's not that easy to, let's say, aside from doing some workshops, but to, let's say, win people over. For example, 
every time we do a workshop, we have some kids who are super enthusiastic, and they tell us, like, yeah, we don't learn this in school. I want more. I want more. Unfortunately, we are not educators, and unfortunately, as a creative studio, we're not only dedicated to technology workshops. So without winning over the schools and the parents, aside from introducing them to these type of things, we couldn't really uh, make it continue like we did with New Out. So that was a learning lesson that we have as designers, because this starting point was not from the exploration we did with, for instance, with New Out's Elderly Home. This really came from us as a studio. We think as young designers, people should know more about technology. So we made these workshops. And we thought it was a great idea, so we did it in the neighborhood. And we, that wasn't enough to, let's say, make it grow. So when we talk about citizen participation as a starting point, a basis of our projects, then yeah, it's very important for us to build upon the interests and talents and challenges that people are facing. Yeah. Uh, ownership or perceived ownership? Uh, it's mine as long as I think so. So I'll just illustrate this. It's a bit, again, it's a presentation in working, so I can't be pre super su precise, precise about it. But So imagine the situation that there's a park in the city. And once upon a time, it was owned by a wealthy landowner or by a company. And out of goodwill, this private person made a park and let people use the park. Eventually, for whatever reason, the city took over. They bought the land. Now it's city owned. And later on, uh, the, the city wants to sell it, the land. So they're looking into developers, investors. And there is someone again, from the private sector who's interested to take it over, eventually. Not right now, maybe in five years, maybe 10 years, but it's going on. And meanwhile, people in the city, especially around that neighborhood, are using that uh, land as a park. They grew up there. Uh, they still use it, they love it. Who owns the park? And of course, you know, you can be all technical about that, but that's not what I'm trying to go through. But just these type of situations, I hope this illustration sort of helps you to imagine some things that you can more relate to in these sort of like, like yeah, you can be all technical about, you know, but you can, you can go into who actually owns it in contract, in real estate. No, that's not what we're talking about. In this situation, do the people living in that neighborhood have a say in that? And I guess our assumption is at least leaning towards, yeah, they do have some sort of say in it. And then at least if the city is positive, uh, also shares that mindset, then we can do something about it. But that doesn't mean they're gonna, you know, again, in terms of be very, uh, how is it, technical about ownership. But it's about how people perceive or share that ownership and then can we work something out? Um, example project that we have in Eindhoven is called Agents of Change. It's, yeah, it's a grandiose title, but it's very simple. It started off also very earlier in our career that we realized social projects are a bit more trickier to ex ex explain. Um, we're designers, but we just don't design chairs. And even if we make a chair, we have this grand social story behind it why it's such a wonderful chair. So, and it wasn't just us. So we eventually started making these sort of interventions, tours in the city, uh, visiting social projects, and then gradually not just designers, artists, neighbors, uh, businesses, uh, just people in general um, working in the city, doing things voluntarily. You would say they are very active and very proud of what they do. So of course, people do things in the streets. Uh, they create organizations to help people integrate. Um, they create these sort of help platforms. They do artwork. Um, so all wonderful things in the city. And this project grew for us to eventually into collaboration with the, the Modern Art Museum in Eindhoven, uh, called the Van Abe Museum, to explore how we can 
makes this sustainable? And how can we uh, connect an institution just as the Vanabe, a cultural institution, to connect better with the city, with the urgency of the city, and more importantly, what on earth people are doing in the city? Uh, this was a series of videos we made for the museum that we captured uh, stories from, I think, the 80s of Eindhoven uh, to yeah, share their experience on various social topics uh, from back in the day. Uh, part of the project grew into also presenting, not just presenting our work at the museum at the exhibition, but using the museum as a, as a location, as a platform to have discussions, to address questions and challenges people are facing uh, in the city uh, on a daily basis, but especially when they want to do a project on their own. So, Agents of Change by itself, yeah, it's a project about active citizenship uh, and from our perspective, celebrating what people are doing, giving them attention. But it turned out it was for us an exploration to, yeah, learn about how people perceive ownership and how people take charge in addressing their urgencies on their own without anyone's help. And in many cases, the things people come up with are quite different from what would come up in, for instance, a conference, or when you're in a room with a lot of professionals or people who represent institutions and the government. And what we're trying to do is make a connection in between what people are doing in the city and what policymakers are, are, are trying to achieve and mix it up together to help in that negotiation of ownership. And again, as designers, as co-designers, what we do is then develop processes that we did for new out from beginning to end to have everyone involved and the whole purpose of this is through that process that there is a perceived that, that there is responsibility for whatever outcome that we come up with together so that means it's like in we don't really always have a uh, let's say a solution to a societal urgency or challenge. But what we try to do is as long as we get the right people to work together for a given amount of time, that at least they can agree and take ownership of the conclusion. And it might not be as ideal and as beautiful as people would have wanted, but as a creative studio, then our focus is in, uh, yeah, trying to bridge that trying to help people to come to a conclusion and action that uh, they can own. The last thing is uh, about uh, resources, or accessible resources. And again, this is, just please keep in mind, it's really from the perspective of participation. Um, and if we're talking about projects based on participation, at least in our experience, we really, really have to be aware of uh, what kind of resources are out there. And I will be a bit more specific what I mean about resources uh, in the examples. But I'm mentioning this because I don't think, especially in this case, this is the ideal approach. But again, it's from our experience. Because I think there are also wonderful ways to uh, bring in uh, resources that are not uh, immediately accessible for communities to make beautiful change, to create innovation. So please just keep that in mind. Uh, one a project we did in 2015 was a summer school. And coincidentally, we called it the Y City. And it was, very, it was loads of fun for us because, again, in that neighborhood that we were based in, it's called Door Knockers. And in there, we were sort of in a very peculiar situation in the summer of 2015. First, uh, like much similar to a gathering like we have right now, we ended up with a group of very enthusiastic young professionals who wanted to do something related to sustainability, related to circular economy. What? We don't really know, but we want to do something. We don't just want to talk about it, let's do something. At the same time, from the other side, we were expecting a group of 20 Russian students architectural students and urban design students to come to Eindhoven to do something. And 
what was never clear for them, but they just really wanted to come to Eindhoven. And we are a studio based in Eindhoven, very focused on locality. So can, what can we do with this whole situation? In the end, we ended up with a summer school. It was a lot of fun. Again, it was a three-week summer school. And as designers, we created a whole program, whole process. If you're interested in the results of the summer school, I would, um, I'll would i be showing you the URL to our website at the end of the presentation. But if you go to our portfolio, you can find uh, the Y-City Summer School, and there's a link to a digital PDF that we published to get to know actually what we did. But anyway, aside from that, it was a fun circular economy personal development, co-creating scenario. So, but what I'm talking about resources is about, in this case, how we arrange the whole project. So we had the energy of these young professionals. We had students involved who were very talented in their study, but also we quickly realized, or actually um, working with students, we knew that personal development is a very important thing for students. We work in the neighborhood. We want to create value for the neighborhood. And there was no money at all for this. So what could we do? So basically, we took all of those together with the co-creation, created basically a voluntary summer school um, for everyone involved. It was only the students who paid to cover their own costs. Three weeks, working in the neighborhood, circular economy. And again, the, the results and conclusions of that, you can check online. But that was a very interesting experiment for us to make something happen by mixing up all of the ingredients, all of the things that we had at the moment, and uh, making something happen. The last example that I would like to show you is a project called Out the Bird Fabric. Again, very simple. It's a wood workshop. We make furniture with uh, volunteers. It started off very small and modest, in, again, in the same neighborhood of doorknockers. But now it has grown into a foundation that now what our aim is to be a social workspace, um, using furniture making to work together with people with barriers uh, to employment. And I'm pretty much sure that you will have similar initiatives here in Munich as well. It's all the world. The whole idea behind it is, is not very complex. But the reason I put here in resources is because it's about to sort of highlight how we structure the whole project. Out the Bird Fabric as a wood workspace, social workspace is extreme, it's completely embedded into, let's say, the local welfare and care system of, of Eindhoven and that region. Meaning that we work together with, with the municipality, with care organizations, and we are sort of, sort of like a hybrid in terms of how we position ourselves. We take full advantage of the system they have. For instance, people would really like to have um, job training courses, but we don't offer that. What we do, we are a stepping stone for people with difficulties to work in our social environment, and when they're ready, they can move on to other organizations who are trained to give uh, job training, for instance. We are completely dependent on uh, subsidies, partially. We also work on real-life assignments, but uh, a large part of our budget is dependent on subsidies, uh, money from the government, taxpayers' money. And the reason we do, it, we do that, or are not shy about that, is because of how we structured the project. It's, we embedded it basically into the assets, the resources, the structure and platforms that are available in Eindhoven. And based on that, that's how we uh, uh, made the whole structure. So in our case, again, because we're talking about uh, projects that spawn from participation, um, that's the perspective, the approach that we take. Again, these things can be planned, of course. The same project could be, come from the government itself, come from developers and have a beautiful plan and have a different uh, financial structure as well. But in our case, since we started very much with working together with people, that's um, how we created uh, the projects. So to conclude, um, when we talk about motivation and ownership of resources, 
my thought is, if we can get to a point that people say uh, we want something because it belongs to us and we can do it, I think it's a great starting point. Again, I'm not saying this will guarantee the success of a participatory project, because if you recall in the beginning of the presentation, I showed you a bigger list, and there's so many variables, especially if you're working together with those people. Nothing goes according to, to, to how you planned. But at least what I can offer this evening, based on our experience, is if people that you work together with can sort of have this kind of mindset in the beginning, I think it's a great start. Well, uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, that is our website, bromvandun.nl. And you can go have a look, see most a lot of our projects. Uh, we have a description of how we work as well. And uh, yeah, I think we'll have more discussions over the evening. But for now, thanks for uh, listening and for your attention.